Hello, everyone, and welcome to our latest installment of our Future of Wealth discussion series, focusing today on democratizing and de-risking real estate for wealth building. Um, I'm Joanna smith Romani. I'm the co-executive director of the Financial Security Program here at Aspen, and I'm just so excited for today's conversation. Um, we fancy ourselves a little bit of detectives around financial security work, always exploring and digging curio curiously uh, to figure out what are the real kinds of innovations, the new kinds, the expand your mind kinds that can bring real equitable wealth building in our country right now. And we've been really going asset class by asset class to find the possibilities. Um, Ida and I and the rest of our team have just been so deeply inspired by work that we've been digging into in the last months, really looking at the potential of commercial real estate and mixed use real estate as part of a wealth building strategy. We're also familiar with residential real estate, home ownership as part of it. But what else is there in the asset class of like land and buildings that we own that can do something big in our country? So Today, we're we're in for a treat. I am so deeply inspired and excited by the set of speakers we have today. We have researchers, entrepreneurs, innovators, and investors who are really committed to seeing this thing through and making it a reality as a real inclusive wealth building strategy. And, and that's what today is for. So thank you for joining us. And I'm just going to say, let's get started and dig in. So we have more of the, less of the time with just me babbling and more of the time with the amazing speakers that we've gathered together here. Um, so I'm going to invite Tracy to turn on, turn on your camera. Hello, Tracy. How are you today? I'm great. It's so good to be here. I'm excited about this event. Well, I'm, thank you. I mean, first of all, I really got to know you and your work this summer around an event we were doing on the potential and possibility for commercial real estate. And I'll admit that I was sort of a, like a lowercase s skeptic walking in, not like I don't understand commercial real estate, but you know, in, in my world, I'll just be honest as a asset builder, financial security person, nerd, whatever you want to call me for the last several decades, this part of the conversation just really hasn't been sort of mainstream in our field um, and hasn't been a part of what we consider to be sort of real opportunities. And you know, after getting to know you and your research and, and learning from the folks that are on the call today, like I, I am a full like con convert in thinking about how this fits really into a whole wealth portfolio, right? A whole set of wealth activities, not just it on its own. Um, but part of the reason, Tracy, I'm so excited you could join us is like, truly, you're one of the like only one of a few researchers in this country even looking at this, right? I, I think that's true. It's um, a little niche. It, it, Certainly, we want to make it less niche, but it is a little niche. Um, and and you guys have the kinds of the work that you've done at Brookings has the kind of insights that we really need to know to understand the context that this opportunity fits in in terms of building more inclusive and expansive wealth opportunities. So I'm just excited for you to share with us kind of what have you been learning? What's on your mind? Um, what will help us have better foundation to like get into the nitty gritty of what we do? Okay, so I made a set of of slides yeah, that did. are seven yeah. reasons okay. why this is a good idea. So I, I can I can share David them. Letterman top ten, right? All right. I'm not gonna like PowerPoint everyone to death. Like we can let's have a conversation and not like get you know too married to these slides. But I do have these here, okay. and you know perhaps we can use these to guide our conversation, Fantastic. right? So so like to your first point <laughs> that like uh, this is pretty niche. <laughs> You know, you're right. Like this isn't a part of the conversation because the vast majority of people do not own any commercial real estate, right? This is an asset class that we are just not familiar with. So, you know, what I'm showing here is that even amongst white households, that it's less than 10% of white households that own any uh, commercial non-residential commercial yeah. real estate, right? Because like uh, um, you know, commercial real estate is like any income producing asset. And so that can, that can include like apartments for rent. Okay. Okay. But I'm, I focus on the non-residential stuff. So like offices, warehouses, stores, and you know, this is, so this is a very obscure asset class, but, um, it is also a very big <laughs> asset class. Yeah. And, 
you know, uh, if you look at real estate combined, it's the second most common asset class after cash. So it's more common than stocks and bonds, mm -hmm. um, you know, both in terms of the number of people who own it and the number of uh, the overall like aggregate dollar value in the class. And, you know, it's also something that is it, it it's also similar to cash and that it's like it's tangible. Yeah. You can touch it. You can see it. A physical <laughs> asset. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so that means something different to people than than uh, than other asset classes that are that are more abstract. Tracy, can I ask you a question? One of the things I'll say, one of my kind of it's not really a misunderstanding so much as a, a small way of thinking about this. You know, when we were first learning about this uh, earlier in 2023, was that when I think of commercial real estate, you know, I work in downtown DC. So I think of like class A, class B office space, right? That sure. right now, um, because of the changing ways we work post pandemic, just doesn't feel like a particularly, like it is a an investment that has some fragility, right? That people aren't totally sure about. But the work here and the work we're talking about today and the work you're concerned about isn't really, maybe it includes that, I'm not sure, but it isn't really that. So can it's you just- It's not, right? Yeah. So like- this yeah. is we're about. not going to democratize office building ownership, right? Like, like kind of trophy downtown trophy office space yeah. is like at one extreme end of the CRE spectrum, right? You're talking about prior to the pandemic the assets that are like the single highest dollar value per square foot of any real estate asset. Okay. And frankly, like the trophy stuff is still quite valuable post COVID and demand for that remains strong. So like while there is this like, you know, shaking happening in the office market because of what's going on with the BNC space, you know, these remain multi-million dollar assets, right? And the challenge there is different because figuring out what to do about it is in part so hard because of how many multi-millions we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, that have to move around the asset. But, you know, at the other end of the spectrum are, um, are there are far more smaller and more accessible assets that are the ones that are literally closer to home. Yeah. So in my research, I am focused on, uh, on democratizing commercial real estate. I'm focused on neighborhood retail, which yeah. is that's something that we can all reach out and see and touch. Yeah. And that, I mean, you know, there have been changes to how we get our stuff, but dentist offices, hair salons, like picking up your pharmacy, like these things largely need to be in person near you, right? So it's a different demand for the space and use for the space than necessarily a, a person like me that can work virtually. So, you know, I, I want to be clear that like retail is also going through a huge disruption right now, right? It's not just like office spaces that have been challenged by the pandemic. The challenge for retail is uh, predates the pandemic, right? And is related to how um, logistics is changing, but also like how consumers prefer to shop, the rise of social media, the rise of the experience economy. There's like all this stuff that is really um, motivating a, a, a big like moment of innovation in retail business models. Interesting. Okay. So what, ha but what has been harder is that it's, you can change a business model much faster than the built environment <laughs> changes. Yeah. So we have all these new kinds of businesses and all these new ways of doing business, trying to fit themselves into the same old stores that yeah. has led some people to conclude that stores are obsolete, that brick and mortar is over. We're just going to shop online, but that's not true, right? Like um, the issue is just that brick and mortar has, it's difficult, costly, slow to adapt. That makes total sense. Different challenge. Yeah. And an, an issue that disproportionately impacts black and brown neighborhoods, because in places where access to capital is more challenging, that makes it even more challenging for the built environment to adapt. Change and so yeah. you, cr you have a paradox where what we saw during the pandemic was this incredible burst of entrepreneurial energy coming out, especially from black and brown communities where many workers, um, in, essential workers in leisure and hospitality were terribly impacted by the pandemic and lost their jobs. Um, 
but had great new ideas <laughs> that they, you know, uh, had nothing left to lose <laughs> and some time and space to uh, potentially pursue. Yeah. So yeah. there's all this entrepreneurial energy and it needs somewhere to go. Very interesting. Well, let's move then to your number two point, which, you know, may be related, um, but specifically talking about kind of retail redlining and some of the other kind of equity issues in our country around actual real estate. Yeah. So I think like, you know, when you come to the racial wealth gap conversation, you come to it motivated by caring about communities of color, the households and families within them, and their ability to thrive. And, um, you know, th what I'm observing here is that um, this is, for me, it's not just about wealth building, that um, it's important that people in places just have what they need. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and, yeah. and there are huge disparities in terms of access to retail across neighborhoods in the United States. This is a missed market opportunity for retails, retailers of all races. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's also, uh, and, and speaks to like the, um, how there's a need to, you know, unlock the potential of black entrepreneurship um, and, and enable it to thrive. Like that would benefit not just black entrepreneurs, but black neighborhoods, black communities, um, the black workforce. Um, you know, and doing all of those things would address the racial wealth gap in a really meaningful way. Um, but, you know, this is something that uh, I think there's also just like a needs based case to address that, like everybody wants to uh, people want to live where they can access stuff. That's right. That's right. Well, and in our work, and then we can move on to, to this to the points you're making, which I really appreciate that this is not just about the way the ownership of the commercial real estate might change your balance sheet, but the the other kind of really important impact that it has, which is sort of what we're walking through. This is like the placemaking case yes, for exactly. democratizing CRE that like yeah. the market, the market alone is delivering us this result. Ta-da. Yeah. Well, so and we need about, to do something different. Yeah. And I think about our work on just what are the functions of wealth. And there is a financial function of wealth, obviously, and especially in our country, the way it's set up. But there are other pieces that are actually about kind of the dignity and quality of life that wealth brings. And I think that's intersecting here with, you know, where do people live and can they get the things that they need right. um, and the things that they want? So yeah. let's move into the next thing, which is so interesting. And it is the, the fun intersection for all of our homeownership folks on the call, people that are into residential real estate, um, the intersection between commercial real estate and residential real estate. Yeah. Right. So like, this is the, this is like where I get really passionate yeah. <laughs> um, because I think that um, the placemaking case isn't just like a cute case. Yeah. That's about like um, feeling good, meeting needs, right? right? This is also just like, this is like a basic nuts and bolts fiscal case for why we need to care <laughs> about neighborhood retail and, yeah. and, and start doing it differently because um, it's an input to home prices and we will never um, stabilize home values and fully address um, equitable valuation of homes in black neighborhoods until we get this retail piece right too, hmm. because it is such an important factor in people's willingness to pay for a home. So, you know, it's, this is important to resale value. Yeah. And do you think this particular point, let me think about how to ask this question, is um, like maybe it is well understood in the community development and economic development space, but maybe it's just that residential housers aren't working directly with, um, you know, commercial real estate folks or like what, what do you, is there, is there a piece that's missing about how people understand this point that is, that keeps leading us to maybe only invest in sort of down payment assistance or things related to housing, but not related to commercial side? Yeah. I mean, like we, we are siloed. Yeah. Right. Community development, economic development, placemaking and planning. Those disciplines are all really siloed. They speak different languages. They rarely talk to each other. Um, and it's not just like a, an absence of 
communication. There's often like active distrust mm -hmm. between players across these different sectors. And so there are, um, you know, it's not just a vacuum, but like active barriers <laughs> uh, to, to working yeah. together. And so, yes, like what I'm talking about is like a lack of an integrated holistic practice that is about making great places. Like we here at Brookings, we call this transformative placemaking, right? Like the idea that those four sectors could can work together to solve shared problems. Yeah, okay, that, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, let's definitely spend a little time on number four and then see if I can manage our time well enough to mention the the last ones, but I wanted to make sure we hit on these four with, with some amount of time. Right, so here we are at the fiscal case again, which yeah. is that, you know, I am, I am a homeowner myself. <laughs> I'm, I'm not trying to say that, like, I don't think homeownership is important, but I think that there is a structural challenge in majority Black communities, majority Black jurisdictions, where the underdevelopment and the devaluation of the commercial real estate tax base puts extra pressure on the residential tax base and yeah. creates a negative and self-reinforcing cycle of uh, a paradox of undervaluation and overassessment mm -hmm. um, that is a that is contributing to the racial wealth gap, but is like this is like a structural and cyclical and reinforcing thing that has to be addressed through this the kind of holistic and integrated economic development that's that's just different from the conventional practice. And so, you know, what I'm showing on this graph is that this is just yet again, here's why no one is thinking about commercial real estate, okay? Because it's tiny, right? So if you think about the built environment, most of it's housing, right? Like over 90% of it. Yeah. And and that little orange sliver at the top is all commercial real estate. So some all the places sliver we go. of that is stores. We're not in our home. That's where right? we go. So okay. it's like, yeah, it's just like, <laughs> duh, no wonder. No, it's totally reasonable that no one is thinking about this. Yeah. Except that what I'm showing in the other bar is we got to wake up and start thinking about this because in part, because these assets are scarcer, that their value on a dollar per square foot basis is enormous. And so- um, even though what we found in our research at Brookings is that the devaluation of commercial real estate in majority black neighborhoods is it is less than housing. Housing is like 23 percent devalued and commercial real estate only seven percent. You think, oh, seven percent. Man, I can't. I have enough problems. Right. Do I really need to worry about this seven percent. Well, you do because it works out to almost half of the aggregate devaluation loss in majority black neighborhoods. Yeah, I mean this is substantive amounts of wealth loss and money not being, you know, yeah. captured and then reused. Um so we just have a few more minutes before we get you. What I'm so excited about how you've set up is that I you know knowing the folks that are coming on board to talk with Ida um some of them are thinking more about this integration that you're talking about and are really working to solve these these siloed problems and have more of a, what was the phrase you use that Brookings use? I love it. Um, integrated? No, the like- Holistic, was, transformative placemaking. Transformative. I was like, yeah. no, it's a powerhouse word, Tracy. Yeah. The transformative impact. Yeah, that's so, our billion dollar word. Yes, I love it. So we want to <laughs> make sure we get to the transformative innovators that are coming after us. But um, do you want to just briefly walk through in a couple minutes, really the headlines from the, the other parts and folks can really find- Yeah, them you have other your, speakers right. who are going to speak to these things better. But so why democratize? right, is a big question that we're going to talk about today, right? So like, why not just like, you know, like invest more in CRE? Why does it also have to be different? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's because um, we know that neighborhood revitalization is going to take a thicker capital stack and a democratic capital stack is one way to raise that. Yeah. Um, we, we have tried CDFIing our way out of this problem. And this is not to say that CDFIs have not had a tremendous and positive impact, but um, we need all hands on deck in terms of sources of capital in order to do something about this. So, um, you know, that's this that's something that I think, uh, you know, you have other speakers today who are going to put dollars and cents on. Yeah. And then... Um, you know, there's also this interest in the wealth building space in tangible investment products. Right, as you mentioned. You know, I think, I don't want to get like too spicy, um, you know, in, in when we don't have time to get into this, but I think like one of the things we learned from the popularity of crypto 
is that there is enormous demand out there for alternative investment assets yeah. and that um, ones that are not credible and that do not have a real value proposition will continue to have traction as long as there aren't vetted, de-risked, tangible options out there for yeah. communities that have real reasons why it's not enough to just be like stocks and bonds. Right. That's exactly so right. That's this, an important point. this demand is real. We can yeah. meet it legitimately or we can meet it illegitimately. Those are the two choices. There is not a third choice. Yeah. Thank you, Tracy. What, a, what an important point. And then this last one that I, I think, again, is important because of the holistic approach that we're talking about here. Yeah. So this is, you know, this is transformative placemaking, right? That like, this is the need to overcome place challenges is going to take all hands on deck from all these sectors. And real estate is where a lot of this comes together. And, um, you know, we are just, we're not going to be able to charity our way um, out of the challenges that the communities we care about are facing. And we need to um, inventory the assets that we already have yeah. that are already in these neighborhoods. And we need to retain and leverage their value in order to transform these neighborhoods instead of just allowing that wealth to be extracted. Um, what a great place to, to end here and go into Ida's conversation. Um, and I really do love and appreciate the point of viewing all of these neighborhoods as, I mean, the people are assets, these physical structures are assets. And instead of kind of extraction wealth policies that we have been using, what are the ways- yes, ma'am. Physical assets become actual assets for the people that are in that neighborhood and in that community too. Um, Tracy, awesome. Thank you so much. Again, everyone can go deeper into her research there, but your ability to Reader's Digest for it, for us was beautiful and we are grateful for it. Um, and you and I are going to pop off the screen and I'm going to turn it over to Ida for the rest of the conversation. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Joe, and thank you, Tracy. And hopefully you guys don't go too far because as I call on the other speakers uh, and we have a conversation, there may be ways that we just wanna really, you know, up the ante and bring you back in and, and uh, join, it, join us. So, so hopefully you'll stay on with us uh, in the background. Um, everybody, uh, just for those of you who don't know me, I'm Ida Rademacher. I co-lead the financial security program with Joanna and the, the, the conver conversation about the future of wealth has been um, a long time coming uh, at the Aspen Institute. Uh, we've been, uh, some of the folks that I'll introduce here in a second, joined us for some of our first uh, real conversations about how do you reimagine this field um, and, and, and what its goals are um, back in 2017 and 2018 um, out in Aspen for some of our early workshops. And it's really blossomed as we've published the New Wealth Agenda. And uh, as Joe said, we're excited to be diving deep asset class by asset class on exploring uh, what are the opportunities to really fully create um, a continuum of ownership uh, and investment opportunities in to, to think about um, uh, wealth as a fundamental piece of the puzzle uh, for financial well-being uh, for more households in America. So let me call on the practitioners, the investors, a set of folks who are going to really dig into some of that kind of case making that Tracy made and help us bring that forward. So uh, Talib and Tracy and John, if you could bring on camera. Hi, welcome. Um, and let me just uh, say a little bit about everybody here. So um, so John Haynes is the founding uh, executive director of uh, Community Investment Trust, which we'll hear a lot about uh, out in Portland, but um, really happening um, lots of interest across the country in that, John. and, and um, I'm grateful that you can be here. Uh, Talab Graysman is one of the co-founders and the managing partner of Partners in Equity, uh, which I'm excited. I don't know that uh, as many people in our um, in our conversation today are as familiar with your model, um, and so excited to have that as well. And Erica Wright is the uh, uh, vice president uh, at the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation and uh, the Learning and Insights community there, uh, and um, and J.P. Morgan uh, Chase Philanthropy. Uh, one of the you know real kind of serious 
serious learners and investors in the potential of, of commercial real estate and of shared ownership in particular in those areas. And so we wanted to start to have a, a conversation um, across both practitioners and investors in some of the emerging business models. So thanks everybody for, for coming for coming to, to play today. I'm excited about this. Uh, let me start with um, a question and, and I'm gonna throw this out to, to John and, and Talib first. Uh, and But we're all going to join into this. I asked everybody, would you come off of mute to stay off mute so we can jump in and finish each other's sentences or redirect um, as the energy, as their energy goes. But the first question uh, I'd love to ask you all is um, both of your ventures to what Tracy just talked about um, <clears throat> are focusing um, on ownership of commercial real estate for uh, different target populations. Um, but in communities where there is low wealth communities, um, I would love for you to say a little bit about why you decided what was your own personal or company insight about why that was the asset class you wanted to focus on and a little bit about the model that you are offering in, in the world, like what niche that fits. And, and um, uh, John, if you want to go first and then Talab, come on in and we'll both just get a little bit of that unpacked for, for folks on, 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 on the webinar. Okay, thanks, Ida. Uh, number one, um, when we started doing a human-centered design and talking with people in a neighborhood that we were targeting to to create this uh, community investment trust, which we didn't call anything then, we called it renter equity. So we focused on talking with renters who weren't by default mechanism paying down a mortgage and building wealth. So we had an instinct that commercial real estate may be motivating, and that's exactly what people told us. So number one was uh, people are motivated by the tangibility and and proximity of real estate in our neighborhood. The other one is people building net worth slowly by the default mechanism of paying a mortgage through rent um, is also compelling. Um, but then the strongest thing was just the mutually reinforcing factors that when a neighborhood, in our case now we have uh, 300 plus investors touching 11, 1200 people at the family level. When you have those community members patronizing, paying attention to a building, it reinforces the tenants nonprofit and for-profit tenants, their, their business model, and also uh, ripples in community effects, um, relationship building, safety, and connections. So that's that's the reason for commercial real estate in our case. Tolib? Yeah, so uh, thanks for having me. Uh, mine's very personal, right? So I, I'm a fourth generation entrepreneur, both on my matriarchal and patriarchal side of my family. And I've seen the differences when one family member owned their real estate, both the commercial real estate as well as held residential assets and the overall outcomes for their family. I'm talking about, you know, being able to pay for your son or daughter to go to college or giving them down payment uh, contributions for them to buy a house or start a business. Those types of outputs and understanding the differences is what kind of drives me to, to do this work. And then it's specifically about uh, our work at Partners in Equity. If you're familiar with down payment assistance, that's essentially what we are, but we show up as an equity partner. So we place patient affordable equity capital in the form of down payment for Black business owners to own their commercial real estate. And what makes it patient is the terms that we get into with our business owners staying in it for seven to 10 years, the typical life of a commercial mortgage when it's time for them to refinance. Uh, and we can get more into the model as we you know go through the session. Uh, yeah, that, that's great. Thank you. Um, I, I, you know, there's, as you all know, and as folks on the uh, tuning in will know, uh, you know, we are really taking a, a deliberative approach at Aspen to thinking about a cohort. There is an emerging set of organizations that are taking a look at the kind of data that Tracy talked about and saying, what, what are business viable business models, scalable business models to address this opportunity. And so you all, in many ways, Partners in Equity and Community Investment Trust, represent two, two ends of a continuum that we see between uh, you know, shared ownership, like a full-on business model around shared ownership, and uh, how do you actually uh, kind of scale the opportunities for sole proprietorship as well? Um, so I actually wanna kind of flip us to the next question, which would be say a little bit, Tracy said a little bit about the kind of neighborhood retail uh, that she's focused on. How much does your own uh, focus on real estate mirror what Tracy was talking about or differ? So say a little bit more about the kind of properties um, 
that you are working with um, intermediating access to in terms of ownership for clients. And I maybe say a little bit more in that same place about um, what is, we, we, somebody said earlier, you know, wealth, uh, Tracy said wealth means many things. When we think about functions of wealth, uh, you know, it can move, it can move across the real generational wealth transfer to just the stabilizing functions of wealth. So say a little bit about the, uh, just a little bit more about the kinds of the kinds of property um, and the kinds of wealth creation that you both see and expect for the the heart target populations you're serving. Hal, feel free to go first, or John doesn't matter. Go first. So at um, at Partners in Equity, we primarily focus on owner occupied commercial real estate. So think about that local dentist or that auto repair shop, or think about that. Um, last mile delivery service that now due to changes in logistics now needs a larger warehouse or a larger place to park their truck and vans. That's where our type of capital shows up for down payment. And then when you think about that business owner, a lot of times the business owner that is really thinking about purchasing, purchasing their commercial real estate, they might have the 15 or 20% down in dry powder, but that's a lot of their operational capital. So it's always been very risky for those business owners to take that money they really need for operations to make that leap into ownership. And that's where mm -hmm. our patient capital shows up. So we're working with business owners that have typically been in business for at least three years um, and also have been able to execute on a commercial lease during that time, three years to five years. And, you know, and, and part of an equity, we like to say, like, we hate rent and we really do. Like, I don't even like to rent a hotel room. I wish I could own some of America. <laughs> um, I guess I could through stocks. But that's what we really care about is like working with the business owner. Like if you've demonstrated that you can pay rent and, and we know that the mortgage that you're going to get is typically going to be that amount or less, let's figure out a way to make it get the, get the transaction done to put you in an ownership position. Thanks. Uh, let, me, <clears throat> let me start by explaining uh, East Portland Community Investment Trust. We launched this six years ago on the 1st of November, and it's largely fully subscribed now. And the tenant mix there is a mix of for-profit, non-profit. I think the tenant curation kind of evolved really through some direction of the investors themselves and the community, telling us what they wanted, what they needed, what was missing. Um, we're working now with uh, Erica's help and J.P. Morgan Chase with eight cities around the country doing uh, two four city cohorts. We just wrapped up a convening of the first four cities and they're looking, we put out some mapping tools and some other survey um, assets that we created when we created the pilot. And I think the different cities are, are doing that research now to find out what type of prod, property, commercial retail, and how to do a tenant curation that um, delivers some income and also contributes to the community needs. Most of them are looking at properties similar, I think, to ours, although some of them are, are um, older properties, so historic properties, but uh, the city's, ours is a 29,000 square foot, 1962 mid-century modern building, uh, two floors, roughly 30 tenants, a mix of nonprofits, for-profits. Um, other cities, I think, are looking at historic rehabs and um, a, a range of, of modifying 1980s strip malls and tearing them apart and doing a different configuration of that development. So it's super interesting to see the range of opportunities and options that these cities are looking at. And the cities are, help me out, Erica, it's uh, Albany, New York. They have a property, historic property um, in the first cohort. Albany, New York, Brooklyn, Brownsville in Brooklyn, New Orleans, and, and Minneapolis, Long George Floyd Square. That's the first four. The next four that we're just incubating are Detroit, Again, with two years of support from J.P. Morgan Chase, Detroit, um, West Dallas, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the Seattle metro area. We're looking at Everett, which is north of Seattle. And I think each one's going to have its own characteristic, really, just based upon the realities and, and the market and the target investors they're choosing. And I'm going to bring Erica in uh, in just a sec. And, um, but and, and Tala, we'll come back around to this with you later in the conversation. But John, just to the point of this has been now in, in the works for a number of years. And you actually, when we talked about the kind of wealth, I think many of us can understand how direct ownership appreciates back to an owner 
um, both in terms of managing their costs um, uh, in many ways. Could you describe a little bit of some of the early evidence you have about the way that shared ownership in your model uh, returns to uh, the participants in the model? Yes, you know, we, we approach this from a standpoint of targeting renters and first time investors, um, women, people of color, people that are left on the margins of being involved in, in investing. So we call it an on-ramp to financial inclusion and in investing. And we've managed to, um, through connections in the community, really find the kind of investors that we were targeting. And they're super sticky. We were fully subscribed. People have invested um, about just over 500,000 and net worth of that's about 650,000. So um, on, a, on a financial standpoint, they're getting upside um, dividend, they're getting dividends every year that that's average 7.9%. Share price has gone from $10 to $19 and two cents. So from a financial perspective, it's worked out great. Um, they're sticky. They take a course called moving from owing to owning. It's a peer led course to about people's relationship with, with money. People are voting and more active in the neighborhood than they were before becoming an investor. When we ask people, well, why is that? They say, well, I'm, I'm an owner now. You know, I've got a bigger stake and role in the neighborhood than I had before. So it act, that it activates citizenry and, and collaboration and relationships is something that we aspire to, but that we're seeing it happen is something that's really one of the, you know, outside the financial side of it, it's a, a big driver, I think, in, in how other cities are seeing this as a valuable uh, community yeah. development effort. Right, Eric? Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, well, I am going to, Erica, why don't you come off of mute? Because I think, John, I know what a long road it's been to make the case and to uh, start to be able to think about, um, you know, aspirations for other cities and how to help them and just how to grow, grow what you're seeing. Uh, Talib, you've got your own challenges there. So, Erica, I'd love to invite you in both a kind of what is the, what's the reason you decided to become an investor in this work? What's your read on um, what you hope to learn from that? And, you know, and how closely do you think uh, others are following uh, this? Like, are you alone in the world in terms of some of the philanthropic, that thicker capital stack or, you know, kind of like, so first off, why you? And then, you know, a little bit about what you think this means for others who, who might be watching and still on the sidelines or how we grow that number of people who are, are thinking about this as a viable area uh, to, to become involved. Thanks, Ida. So there have been like 20 points um, during this Take conversation where I wanted to, to jump in, <laughs> so, but I've been waiting patiently. Um, and I'll, I'll actually start at the back and, and work my way to back to your first question, which is to say, one, I don't think we're, we're alone. Um, and I do think Tracy made a good point in that a lot of times our efforts have been very siloed in thinking about wealth building. Um, while expansive in their own spaces, right? We might be thinking about this from a small business perspective. We might be thinking about this from an individual or household perspective or a home ownership perspective. Like we haven't had a lot of opportunity to think about the intersections of these spaces in this work, um, which was what brought us to shared ownership um, as, a, as a learning opportunity, right? Where do we bring neighborhood development, small business expansion um, and individual financial health together? Um, and a lot of the models that you're hearing about today are really looking at the intersection of those bodies of work. And I think there are a number of funders out there who are thinking about like, how do you really propel the efforts forward? And that's at the intersection. So I don't think we're alone. Um, I will shout out Kresge who like has supported some of the work um, beforehand. I know there are a number of local foundations in the cities that we're talking about expanding to through the CIT effort who are also interested. There are a number of large nonprofit organizations who are also thinking about this more deeply. So we're definitely um, not alone in this space, but are happily like out in front charging forward to make the case. Um, I would also say like another Tracy point that was that really resonated and hit home for the why for us is um, the point about like it being important for people to have what they need. Um, and that's at the resident level, that's at the business level, that's at the neighborhood 
level as well. And so thinking about wealth as kind of a vehicle to getting people closer and closer to well-being is critical. And to the point about, um, you know, what does the CIT model bring? At the individual level, John, like in the course of some of our conversations, um, kind of offhandedly made the comment that maybe $400 is not wealth in some people's mind, but it's a significant protective factor when you're talking about low to moderate income households, right? And the volatility of, volatility of their incomes and what they need as a buffer to overcome barriers that might drop them into to significant debt, right? And create significant barriers. So as a like, as something to push folks into a space of wealth, like that is pretty significant. And the other part of that, which I think Talib and John are touching on in terms of like what it brings beyond wealth is a sense of agency. Like ownership um, is, is important, not only in terms of like your feelings about civic engagement, but your ability to control your environment, right? And to have some voice in your environment. And I know, especially as business owners, I, I, I'm based in New Orleans. Um, I live down the street from Bayou Road, which is a historically black business district. And the owner of most of that commercial real estate is a black resident who lives around the corner from that block. Right, so she has been able to exercise some agency in who goes into those businesses and who actually is able to stay. Right, so as market pressures push on that district, like who is able to maintain their business in that space and that also dictates what we have access to as residents. So I think wealth building absolutely um, we are totally bought in to that as like a mechanism and vehicle for advancing overall health and well-being for individuals, like I said, businesses and neighborhoods. Yeah, and thank you. Well, and thanks for calling out other funders. I do think that it's important to know and um, there's the models here. We're gonna go into a little bit more detail. Um, I know MacArthur's been big with um, Chicago Trend, which is another group, Linda Richardson, shout out there. Uh, I think Sunderland and others are looking at local code, which is another, you know, group that we're, but so, and I'm looking at this amazing chat going on. Uh, so to Karen, just know that part of our work on commercial real estate is a, as a wealth innovators cohort. It is very much our goal over the next uh, six months or so to be, you know, producing some of the kind of overarching, who is, who's showing up in this space? What are the new models? What are we, and I mean, Eric, I'm going to put it back to you again in the sense that, you know, both collectively for the practitioners, but also for people who are looking and learning and trying to understand what is the gap in this thicker capital stack? What do we need to do to fill it? How do you size that problem? How do you size the potential returns for communities? Um, uh, we hope to be documenting a lot of that kind of information and making this something that is on a lot of other people's radar screens. Um, so I guess to that one, Erica, to push it back toward you, you know, could you say a little bit more about um, the kinds of questions that you hope to illuminate? Like, what do you think other people are wanting to learn uh, from the kind of, uh, from both uh, uh, Talib and Partners in Equity, but also, um, but also Community Investment Trust? What are the kinds of things that you think folks are trying to learn about these models uh, to, to de-risk investment in some ways? So I was just gonna, I was gonna go right there, right? So right. Um, I think, the, the capital piece is critical. Talib lifted up patient capital. Um, John, the model calls significantly for impact investment, which also happens to be patient, more flexible in terms of terms, right? Like more accommodating to an alternative, like capital stack or investment model. And so I think the question you know, on our minds is do we have the infrastructure, do we have the right capital ecosystem in place to ensure that projects like this can move forward successfully? Is that is that about um, expanding what current institutions are doing or is that about introducing new products and entities into the market? That is that is a big question for us, right? Tracy said we've we've attempted to CDFI our way out of this 
um, that has only gotten us so far. So the, the question in my mind is, do CFIs need to play an expanded or different role? Do we need to introduce new entities or products mm -hmm. into the market? Do we have other institutions that should be doing something differently to fill in those spaces? And then to the point about de-risking, I think we think a lot about um, like de-risking on the part of the, the large investors, but I think, you know, what was appealing to us around the CIT model was the de-risking for the residential investors, right? So what does it mean? Like if I'm taking my, my dollars <laughs> that are limited and placing them in a community investment, what is my protection as a resident um, to ensure that I don't lose my money in that investment? And so I, th I think there's a question for us around that as well. And then um, continuing to measure like the broader impact, what I um, like have thought about in terms of social cohesion and equitable development and anti-displacement, like what, what impact um, did these efforts ultimately have on um, communities long term. Mm -hmm. Well, let me um, let me take that, Erica, back to Talib and John in terms of your own experience with some of uh, the kinds of partners you've needed to um, bring on board to help facilitate the kinds of work that you're doing. Uh, John, in your case, uh, to the point of de-risking, there's a specific vehicle. You're, there's a specific kind of a piece of an insurance um, construct that you've developed as part of. Uh, managing risk for the individuals and bringing on financial partners. And, and Talib, for you, I'd love for you to tell a little bit of a story about what are the kinds of partners you have and where what is the gap between how you're accessing um, partners uh, for your partners in equity now and, and where that needs to go. John, you want to, you can go ahead and start in whichever whichever one. But if I was clear as mud, I can restate that. Yes, I'll I'll go first, um, <clears throat> and I'll I'll try to be swift here. Okay. Um, we used uh, a securities exemption from 1933, a federal e exemption um, that that allows us to offer a stock offering to low-income unaccredited investors targeting um, first-time and poor investors by giving them complete downside risk protection and liquidity, um, which seems impossible. It's not impossible, however. Later this afternoon, it's getting more hard because we use a direct pay letter of credit from a bank. Um, and we've had this in place now for six years and, and it has to be in place. Um, it's, you know, do no harm for the investors. They can cash out anytime without losing their money. Um, but the struggle right now is we, it's the underlying asset has increased in value. So at a loan of value of 75%, I'm gonna be nerdy with the bank stuff here, but, um, we need to maintain that covenant and a debt service coverage. So it's a very strong property. It's performing well, delivering dividends, share price change. Um, but to right size the direct pay letter credit every year, as the exposure for the investors if they all cash out tomorrow. Um, that direct pay letter credit um, as of today is gonna be the amount of the underlying mortgage. So you have to put that together. So it's a leveraged property and without some sort of greater incentive for banks to engage in this kind of a, of a community development effort. I think we need um, you know, a liquidity fund or some other form of, of uh, credit protection or the banks just simply aren't gonna do it unless there's an enhanced widening of the Community Reinvestment Act to allow this to be a contingent liability like this to get CRA credit. All right, hold that thought, that's great. Talib. Uh, well, full disclosure, we're currently fundraising, so I, I don't want to go too far into what our needs are because I don't want to breach any type of rules here, um, but just our capital stack is made up of foundations, banks um, make up our capital stack, and that balances out different type of risk-adjusted capital as we raise money. Um, the partners that we work with are CDCs, uh, CDFIs, regional banks, and kind of deal flow happens for us kind of two ways, right? One is uh, when you you stand up an organization saying you're putting patient equity capital for black business owners, your phone just rings and rings and rings, right? So we have constantly influx of people looking to get capital, but then also through on the B2B side with our banking partners. So that business owner shows up and has really can be underwritten, but has had the capital gap for, for down payment. 
And that's also how the, it works for us. I mean, what we're really looking for now is more partners to that believe in what we believe in. Uh, most recently, we had a, a, a bank uh, move us through investment committee to make an investment in it, which will then open up it, the room for more banks to be able to participate in, in, in investing within Pi. Great. So obviously, for those listening from banks, what, what we what what I'm what, what we want to do part of what we want to do at Aspen is we crowd in learning questions for some intensive work with a bunch of the innovators is to know what are the kinds of questions you would need answers to to make a case for this kind of work or to explore it more yourselves. So we want to look across a set of stakeholders who would be interested in this, this the kind of innovations that you're hearing about here and and others that will will be able to put a, a spotlight on um, to make sure that when we produce uh, you know something that it's it's really answering the kind of questions that would that would hopefully crowd in on the space. Uh, we have a little bit of time. I know you all have been scanning um, the questions that are coming in through the chat. It's it's this huge conversation over there, which is which is which is typical for these these webinars. But it always cracks me up just how much uh, people are connected with each other. Uh, I'm just wondering, you know, both back to you, Erica. Um, but but Talib and John, uh, other pieces um, of your work or the conversation or what you heard from Tracy that you just want to bring into the conversation right now. So I'll give it some space to either answer something that you saw come up in the chat or just bring in another point I haven't touched on yet before we go to some final closing statements. Uh, Talib, go ahead. So, you know, we talk a lot of bit about like, I've heard a lot of talk about like, what's the, what are the, what are the, 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 the benefits to the business owner? And one of the benefits that we, we have immediately seen through our first investments was like the leverage and the power and the autonomy that it creates for that business owner. Like hearing Erica talk about Bayou Road and the fact that that African-American business owner owns that property that allows for space to happen the way they want space to happen in their own community. One of our first investments in Durham, North Carolina was a really strong entrepreneur. It was a strip of um, retail. And he, he took a, what had once been a three bay business and that was had been transformed into one large 3000 square. Foot. He took that, turned it back into three 1000 square foot spaces and rinsed them out at very, two of them out at a very affordable rate for businesses that he wants to be place based in the community, as well as have an office for him. And that was good enough until I was walking downtown a few months after we made the investment and the deal was done. And I saw his name on another building. And it, and it was a it was under construction sign with his name and his phone number on it. So I called him. I said, hey, man, what's this? He says, oh, yeah, I, bought, I just bought that. And we're renovating that, too. And I said, well, you didn't need any of my money? He says, no, I didn't. Right. Because he had already created that equity event for himself and within six months was making additional investments. And for us, that that's the sign of, of a successful um, investment. And I want to see more and more of that, you know, and I love what John is doing with with um, what local code is doing mm -hmm. um, with Chicago trend. And I think that this cohort that you all are creating is gonna help us all continue to innovate and bring solutions. And I would say, so, you know, as a part of, yes, I'm a part of the learning and insights team, but I would argue that all of our program officers are part of the learning and insights team, right? We are making investments for, for case making. And so, um, you know, every opportunity there is to um, better understand what is going to advance kind of the long term outcomes for communities. Um, we, we are taking that that opportunity to explore that innovation or that solution, I think, to, to Talib's like example of a story, I had an opportunity to visit um, with the, the Portland business owners and um, the space and to the to to Tracy's transformative <laughs> um, big scale term. I think it's hard to really um, like put a put a. Um, it's hard to quantify the opportunity um, beyond like experiencing the difference in a space that is owned by people who believe in it, who live in the community, who are invested in seeing it succeed and thrive. Um, beyond just the retail space um, on a webinar, right? Like it's hard to quantify that. And I would, I would argue that the, that the um, story Talib 
just gave is like it is it is infinite and endless what the opportunity is if we take if we take the initial risk if we take the initial chance to make the case that actually this can be successful and it can create communities and environments that are um that are strong and more equitable and you know sustaining and thriving right i i think we are limited in what we we are oftentimes limiting ourselves and what the possibility is mm -hmm. um in in balancing out what the risk is like the risk oftentimes is so small for what we are actually aiming for right we are holding ourselves back well said, Erica. Uh, John, I want to throw it to you, and then I'm going to actually come around as some closing remarks here in this. But you, you just said the thing that I want to, I want to push us, Erica, over time to actually try to be able to say how big is the opportunity, but for lack of X, right? So you know, when I think about, you know, everything we're talking about here is our, it's 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 transaction by transaction. There's no cookie cutter to like you, John, you said, all of these properties are gonna be different in your replication cities. However, the fundamental toolbox that you're building um, is, is there. Similarly, on a lot of prep calls, there was a lot of complementarity between John, how you work and Talib, how you work, right? There's not just how does each of these models potentially, what's the opportunity horizon for each of your models to make a difference in more and more communities and more and more lives, but what's the opportunity for collaboration across some of these models that are emerging as we as we come together. So um, while I don't expect that we have numbers right now, if there's anything that you would want to say as in, in, a, in a closing remark for now, which again, this is just kind of kicking off a lot of the wealth innovation work we're doing in this space, um, uh, how big do you see the opportunity for your work? Um, and what do you think it's going to take to achieve it? I'd love to to leave that as kind of like a, a closing thought for, for for you all as we as we wrap up today. Boy. Um, you know, the demand for for replicating the community investment trust, there's a, a, a serious legal and financial fidelity that needs to be in place. That the term CIT has become community investment trust has become widely used, but it really is is only done if you do it correctly with with respect to downside risk protection, liquidity, et cetera. Um, but the demand for the model is ex exceeding our capacity to, to coach and counsel the cities. Um, so we're doing them in cohorts and we found that to be really efficient um, and productive for the cities to collaborate with each other. And we're ultimately building a community practice so that there's a learning engine and a sharing model. So this can scale more rapidly. Um, but in support of that, the base equity capital which is basically the capital that shifts to the community over time. Um, that ought to be a more compelling ask, I think, to foundations and institutional funders than it's been. Um, started vetting that. And then clearly getting the banks engaged in, in getting CRA credit for doing these and accepting some of that risk um, on the direct pay letter credit is going to be super critical, unless we recapitalize with other forms of, of, um, of capital or have a guaranteed reserve fund or something like that. But I think the CRA path, if that were to emerge out of the recent OCC and intergovernmental ag agency um, research, um, I haven't seen what that entails, but I'd love to see that be a component part of what's, what's hopefully on the horizon. Thanks, John. And I, we didn't talk much about this, but just to know that there is a there is a policy angle to a lot of what we're going to be trying to learn with you all about what are some of the unlocks that are related to um, align incentives through policy mechanisms as well. So thank you for mentioning that. Taleb, uh, quickly, big opportunity. Where to? Well, I think the, the one of the big things is, is, is there's a little too much paralysis through analysis when it comes down to moving money. The time is always now and the time oftentimes in the black community was yesterday. So I want to see money moving much faster. In 2022, you know, commercial real estate as a whole entire asset class was 1.3 trillion. Less than 1% of that went to funds doing work like this. And if we just were to take that 1% to 3%, you're talking about a $13 billion to a $39 billion opportunity. And I think that that can happen over the next few years. Uh, we just got to move faster. Great. And Eric, anything final for you? I will let you close it out on that. 
move money right. faster. That's great. Yeah, move money <laughs> faster, but don't but don't break things. I love it. Um, well, you all, thank you so much. Again, it's just a little bit of a tip of the iceberg of the conversations we are hoping we're going to inspire in many other places uh, through learning even more deeply about the work you're doing and uh, the ways that it's transforming lives and communities. Super excited about what's ahead. Um, we will. Uh, be, this is going to conclude for this year, the Future of Wealth discussion series, but stay tuned as we release the entire slate of discussions we have planned for 2024. Uh, and then from the Financial Security Program, the last uh, live conversation, and I think, you know, John, it actually goes back to some of what you just talked about, um, within our uh, work on uh, a national financial inclusion strategy, and how do you think much more broadly about uh, financial inclusion in the U.S. That, that that is focused on outcomes across a wider range of things than conversations about just a bank account, but everything we're talking about here. Uh, December 5th, we'll have a live um, uh, uh, discussion. It'll be in person and live uh, live streamed. Uh, so uh, there's information up on the up on the board about that. But I just want to say thank you again to all of you. Thank you to Tracy. Thank you to Joanna. Uh, thanks for spending your time with all of us today, everybody who joined in. Um, we'll see you again soon.